You are listening to episode 243 of the Game Deflators Podcast. My name's John, and I'm joined by Ryan. Hey, everybody here at the Game Deflators Podcast. We like to talk about games. We recently picked up games we're currently playing, and once again, we try this again, and again, and again, in this week's Inflation Deflation Challenge. So we said we were going to do it last week, and we did. We played a little bit of Returnal on the PlayStation 5. Yeah, it was uh, definitely my favorite time to do things over and over again that we've experienced recently. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in comparison to Deathloop, which we played last week, when it comes to looping-based games, this was definitely up my alley compared Mm. to obviously Deathloop. Uh, But we'll get into that in our inflation deflation segment a little later. But first, you can find us on thegamedeflators.com, our currently up-to-date website, Facebook and Instagram at The Game Deflators, and Twitter is at Game Deflators. Of course, you can find us on YouTube, search up Game Deflators on there. And you can also find us on the podcast app you're listening to right now. Leave us a five-star review. If not, leave us a 10-star review, which is really just two five-star reviews. And leave us a comment if somehow you're listening to us on a podcast app, but you didn't manage to find us on that podcast app. That's impressive. I want to know how you did it. Well, they would have found us on YouTube or Facebook and been like, hey, I don't hear you on this app. But I'm pretty Mm. sure we're on everything. So we should be there. All right. So current pickups and uh, what we're currently playing. I picked up magic cards. Yeah? More yeah. Lord of the Rings? No, I picked up some standard cards. Oh, did you see? Oh, wait. Did it already happen? What? When we went last week? I don't and know. there was the pull? It got pulled? Yeah, it had already happened. Okay. Yeah, I think we were... We hadn't been able to talk because we recorded on Thursday. Yeah, and then we played Friday and it was yeah. pulled Friday. Yeah, so the one ring has been found. Coincidentally, I think it was by an employee. Is that correct? No, it was some dude in Canada. Mm, I want to say that it, somebody told me it was like somebody that worked with wizards. Like the way it was pulled, based on like when they did the grading and everything else, timing wise, it didn't really work out. I don't think so. Based on a turnaround time for grading purposes, it was really weird because the set's only been out for like a week. Yeah, but I imagine if you're like, hey, I got the one ring in, they're going to move you to the front of the line. Maybe. I don't know. Like, they can put off grading, like, a couple inboxed Mario 64s or something for, like, an extra day. It's not going to take long to be like, yep, that's the one. (laughs) It's the one (laughs) ring. Uh, Yeah, I I don't know. Timing-wise, it was kind of weird how it timed out. But either way, it's been pulled, which is pretty cool. But, no, I want to get back into playing a little bit of standard here and there every couple weeks. And so I picked up some cards for a burn deck. And uh, that's my... Easy, cheap way in. It basically cost me $15 to get everything I need for a burn deck. And then I picked up some stuff for a red-green deck, which I've already got the vast majority of. It was just a few extra cards. And that was another, I don't know, like 12 bucks in red-green cards. So I'm pretty much set with two possible red-green aggro or just red burn uh, straight through for standards. So nice. that'll be nice to have two different styles of decks. Um... And then that was definitely this. not a wizards related employee person. Uh, I guess not. Uh, and let's see. So I also got my Game Informer magazine this week. Uh, oh, I saw that in there with the um, uh, Armor Core. Yes. yes. That looks so sick. Oh, man. Yeah. I want to play that game. I'm one of those people that has a Game Informer magazine in the bathroom. Yeah. And it works out great. It's always great to have a copy in there just in case. Mm-hmm. So that that's was... why I never touch them. <laughs> That was a big thing there. Um, Let's see. What else? Uh, How's that White Knight Chronicles going for you? I was about to say. So this week, I started playing a little bit of uh, MTG Arena. So figured, why not? Some of those codes I have, they worked, right? It turns out you can only use one code. Like, because it gives you six packs off one code. Mm. So it was like, that kind of works. So I got... um, Two Lilianas, I got a Shield Dread and like a Phyrexian and something. I got Staff of Domination, a whole bunch of things in MTG Arena. Uh, I built a burn deck on there because it's the easiest thing to just kind of jump in and start. So, start off a burn deck and it's, God, I think I won like 20 matches in a row the other day. And then I just started, for some reason, I started getting demolished by like everything that came my way. But I've been opening up packs on there and, and just kind of building out the collection per se. So I can, you know, of course, build other decks and such. And uh, you 
I don't know if you've played it before, but you essentially earn gold experience and gems whenever you win matches. There's like daily rewards and weekly rewards uh, that you can get. And you just kind of compile wins and, you know, on regular play. And then you can use that gold to enter tournaments, which have prizes, or you can use your gold to buy extra packs. Right now, I'm kind of in the, I tried a tournament uh, with what I had and I got demolished. I got like two packs out of it um, because I won two matches, I think. So it allowed me to get two packs. And I went ahead and so that was kind of worth it. Um, but if I would have got the packs, you know, by purchasing with gold, it would have been like 3000 instead of 5000 to do it. Yeah. So it was like, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I started grabbing packs. And then when you open X amount of packs, you get like a mythic chase thing, which allows you to create cards that you might want. So like the shield I didn't open it. I was able to create it based on other packs being open. So mm-hmm. there's like mythic rare things that you can get. So start playing that, and the main reason being is uh, one of my friends out in uh, Florida, he hasn't really played Magic for years, and he hasn't had the money to play Magic, so I was like, why don't you just jump in arenas? It has a few decks that you can play right off the bat. Here's some codes. So he got like 23 packs off of extra codes that I didn't use, and uh, he was able to build out some pretty good decks, and we played some last night, and he, he played my brother, and then he also played Justin, who's on there. So it was kind of fun, and it's a good way to you know kind of practice and such, like just the moves and, and kind of how I mean, things work. That's definitely something that I should do. I just, I can't get into like digital card game like that. And I don't really have a huge interest in playing like regular magic. Anyways, I just like drafting and I know you can draft on there, but like you need to like win to get money to do draft or you need to pay money to do draft. Every time I go over to Drew's house, he's just doing drafts and just paying money to do it. I'm yeah. like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. That's the thing. Like I would, I would much rather not spend any money on this game. So I'm, yeah. I'm not spending any money. So cause then you're double dipping. Like if yeah. you're all digital with magic, fine. If you're all physical, fine, but there's no reason to double dip. No, absolutely not. The only reason you do it is for, no, not double dip, but the only reason you play both is really to kind of like hone your skills, play against other decks that are in the meta that, you know, just to kind of practice this type of thing. maybe theory craft decks and then decide if you really want to buy those cards in real life yeah pretty much that type of stuff um so that's really the only reason and then white knight chronicles i've gotten to the city of uh greta is where i'm at now which is about i want to say a third of the way through the game maybe a little past a third of the way through the game so i haven't been playing it too much this week because i've just been super busy and mtg arena was something i started up and Obviously, painting my minis. You saw the minis mm-hmm. I've painted as of late, which has been, been kind of fun. Been busy. Yeah. And then D&D prepping. And, of course, we drafted the week before. So there's been a lot going on and just really haven't had a time to, to really dig in. But that's that's my week. So nice. how about you? I did not purchase anything because why would I? And uh, I went on vacation for a bit. And I like to bring a game on vacation. So I brought many games. And I did not play Zelda at all. <laughs> so that plan of mine went out the window. So what I did play was Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga on my Game Boy. And it is so much fun. Like, I have never really um, thought too much about those games. Like, I knew that they were like Mario RPGs. And with my love of Paper Mario, I've definitely seen them recommended to me before. But, oh my gosh, it's just so much fun. Like, have you any experience with these games? I think I played a little bit of it, but it's been so long, so I I will say no. Yeah, just the mechanics of, like, you're, like, running around the world as Mario and Luigi, and, you know, A is Mario, or B is Luigi, or you could swap them, but it's like, you gotta jump for both people, or, like, whoever's in the back, use their hammer to smash the guy in the front to make him tiny, or make him go into the ground, or use the, like brothers, like, to help do a super jump, or a spin jump, or something, and it's like, very fun, the navigation and just going around the world and controlling both of these characters simultaneously. And then the same in combat where it's like you're Luigi's B and you're Mario's A. And it's so when you're menuing through like all the attacks, it's just always A for Mario and always B for Luigi. And I just, I like that how it's locked in and the controls feel like each button is a character and it really gives like a lot of depth and interest to what otherwise would probably be like a pretty simple system. And um, it's got great like active time or uh, active battle system where you're defending yourself and counterattacking. And um, <laughs> there's even some enemies that I'm fighting right now in this spot that I'm at that are like the 
Dr. Mario, the little germs. Mm -hmm. And so if they're, if you're fighting multiple of them and you get them all to the same color, they all die because they like match. And so there's just like so many fun things going on in here. I'm having a really good time and I'm hoping that this is one that I will be able to carry through and finish. I probably got like eight hours into it or something. And I think it's not too long. It might be like 12 to 15 hour game. I oh, think. it's not bad. Yeah. You yeah. should be able to finish that. And then, uh, what what is this number next to this yeah, next so one? I did play some Pikmin, John, but what I did was I played the demo for Pikmin 4 on the Switch on my trip a little bit, and that was super good. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's fun being able to customize your captain and um, the dog you get. Uh, I think it's Ochi. Uh, he's super cool. I mean, I didn't make it all the way through the demo. Like, I know you can get like a certain amount of points and then you can finally move on and i just kind of played it for like a little while until it was my turn to drive and i didn't pick it up again after that but it was good to get a little bit of pikmin action in i knew that you would be questioning whether i had done any pikmining so i decided to do a little adjacent pikmining the other thing you got to play and summer's gonna be closing is the darkness summer's barely begun my friend no 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 arizona summer is just a little longer but it, it's it'll end in like you know technically like september yeah i know i i moved the ps3 downstairs last night and i put it in the bedroom and i put the game down there too so i'm hoping to get started on that um maybe sometime this week get started and finish soon it's actually a short game so you should be pretty quick with it mm -hmm. yeah that I, well i mean <laughs> look at pikmin yeah that's true that's true um all right well let's dive into our discussion topic this week uh you brought up final fantasy to me yeah so i was watching um all the final fantasy 16 stuff a lot of people that i watch have had a lot of different things to say uh, Skill Up was, I think, the first review that I saw, and he was none too keen on the game, really. Uh, Commander Sterling, also not super keen on the game. And then yesterday, uh, Gerard the Completionist put out his review, and he gave it a completed rating, which uh, for like a big giant RPG, like that seems like pretty rare, but he really loved it. And in the news, what I've been seeing is a lot of talk of sales and stuff. So it's already crossed 3 million copies shipped. Uh, this was in an article by Ethan Gatch on Kotaku uh, published on Friday. So I, I don't know if it's gone up too much more since then. But uh, in the second week of reported sales in Japan, it has dropped um, quite a bit. So let's see. Physical sales are 75% lower than the launch week of Final Fantasy XV. So that's a comparison. But in its week one to week two, it went from 336,000 to 37,000. So an 88% drop in its second week of sales in Japan. Hmm. So there's lots of, oh, you know, they just released it on PS5 as an exclusive. Not everybody has a PS5 yet. I mean, hey, we're like three years into that game. You can't keep saying that as an excuse forever, but obviously limiting it to only the next-gen console. You're saying Japan, right? For yeah, Vegas? that's Japan sales, physical release sales, not a digital sales track. Yeah. So it got me thinking about things like, yeah, it's not as... I mean, that's a huge drop-off in week-to-week, -week, like 88%. Like, that's not really what I would expect to have happen. And to see the sales versus the Final Fantasy 15, I mean, a lot of people do just do digital sales now. But, I mean, they tried really hard with this game to get everything on the disc and get it out as, like, a complete on-disc package, which is very attractive in this day and age, you know, with all the day one patches and everything. So that's something that I was expecting to, you know, maybe carry through, like maybe drive some more people to do physical as opposed to digital. But, you know, maybe it just doesn't make that much of a difference to people. But also tracking like the difference between Final Fantasy 15 and this one, you know, 15 came out, people were really hype about it. And then 
it kind of like lost its way. Like people like in retrospect don't really think that highly of Final Fantasy 15. And a lot of people going into 16 are like, oh, this isn't my Final Fantasy because it's all action game. And they're, you know, very much saying that it's not. But other people are saying, no, this has so much Final Fantasy DNA in it. And Final Fantasy is always different. Like it hasn't been just a regular turn-based combat in like a long time. And thinking back at Final Fantasy, I mean, leave excluding 7 Remake because that's kind of its own beast. You know, that had its own install base of, you know, the most ravenous fans in the series and the most popular game in the series. So, and that had an amazing combat system that, like, really went on both sides of the aisle. You got good action. You got a really cool, interesting, solid... Um, you know, turn-based approach that you could do with it as well, switching between your characters and managing everybody's stats. And um, in this one, you're just one character, and it's all action, and there's, like, no status effects and things to slow the combat down or, or change any of that kind of thing. There's a lot different about this one, but there's a lot different about 13. People didn't really like 13. There was a lot different about 12, and people didn't really like 12. So yeah, and the arguing, last three haven't even really been that huge and successful that people can say, yes, that was like an amazing Final Fantasy as a huge collective. Everybody agrees on that. Yeah, an argument can be made that 10 was the last good Final Fantasy. And, and 14, technically speaking. Yeah, the Realm Reborn 14. And that's the guy who made this one. Yeah. So 16, I haven't played yet. I haven't even done the demo. I want to play it, but I also want to wait. Right? I'm... At this point, it's not going to happen where I'm going to sit back and play Final Fantasy 16 pretty consistently, given mm -hmm. where I am, my life and kid and everything else. So it's going to take a while for me well, to get to that And you want one. it cheaper. And I do want it cheaper, yeah. Um, reviews have been a mixed bag you know, on this one. They all haven't been stellar. Um, but I will say that you know, just in what you've stated with the way that the combat is set up, um, you know, I think people are itching for like that old turn-based style combat for a Final Fantasy. I, I was looking while well, you were talking as well at like some of the data in terms of sales and such. And, you know, I was like, okay, when did the PS5 release? When did Final Fantasy release, right? So you're looking at like a, essentially a two-year gap, two-and-a-half-year gap, right, for install base. And I was like, okay, well, he said Final Fantasy 15, or uh, yeah, 15, sold 75% more over a period of time, right, during this period looked at that install base and it's the same it's like a two and a half year gap on that too I got so my final fantasy 15 with my ps4 slim and that came out like yeah two and a half years into the ps4 life cycle yeah exactly so you know you can't use an install base argument there you can't use the argument well, that was multiplat. that uh, was on xbox as well yeah but I mean, the amount of Xboxes that are for sale or that are owned in Japan right now, though, like exactly. it wouldn't even make a drop in the bucket, even if it was multiplayer. Yeah. And I was even like, OK, well, it's like a Japanese population compared to it, you know, and yeah, I mean, there's no argument to be made. I mean, it's just poor sales all around. Um, I mean, you could look at it and say, well, you know, based on the current um, install base of PS5, three million copies, you know, in terms of physical is actually pretty good. That's two hundred and ten million dollars you know, in overall revenue, uh, when you figure out 3 million copies sold at 70 bucks a pop on average, which is probably a little more. So you're just looking at about 210 uh, billion or 210 million, which is going to eclipse that figure that we talked about the other day, right? Um, last week where AAA games are costing about 150 to $200 million. So they've technically made profit right mm -hmm. on this game and it'll only get better from there. And it's only physical. So the game is profitable. Uh, which is a good thing. It'll be on PC next year, I think. It's supposed to be on PC once they get all that figured out. So it by all means is not going to be like, you know, uh, a failure or flop, right? It's a successful game in general. But in comparison to prior Final Fantasies, I think Square really needs to look at this and say, this, you know, 12 was okay in terms of sales. 13 was okay I mean, in terms of sales. they made like three 13s, right? Uh, yeah, you had like so, 13 versus 13, like you had all that well, craziness Well, versus there. 13 became 15, but there was like a 13-2 and then Lightning's Revenge Oh, yeah, Lightning, yeah, that's right, that's right, versus, well, no, Final Fantasy was versus 
14, wasn't it? And no. then it turned into like 15? Final Fantasy versus 13 was announced like forever ago, and then that became Final Fantasy 15. Gotcha. And we anticipated it was going to be 14, but they went ahead and made the online, and then we got 15. Yeah, that's whole mess there. And that's part of it too, right? Like all the confusion that kind of stemmed from that. And, you know, you're, you're coming off of a Final Fantasy 15 that wasn't very well received from the, the vast majority of fans. And then you go with a very similar style of overall combat and whatnot for the next game, and it's just... You know, people aren't feeling it. And you beat so, 15. I, I liked 15, actually, but I liked the open world aspect of it the most. Um, you know, you really, it really was open world Final Fantasy, which was a nice, for me, it was a great uh, refresher for the series. But this kind of it was goes into that and gets away from it at the same time. Yeah. This is like corridors and open areas, but it's not like a big open world in that same way. But see, what's interesting is like my favorite Final Fantasy is Final Fantasy X. And that's super linear. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the things I didn't like about Final Fantasy thirteen is that it was super linear. Yeah, it's weird how you can have mixed opinions on both, but I really remember like playing Final Fantasy fifteen or ten and yeah, it's just like a but yeah. I mean all games were like that at that point. Not, not really. I mean there were some games that were open world and such, but yeah, you're right. I mean there's a lot of games that that were that type of style, right? But when you look at Final Fantasy seven eight and nine you kind of had like the open world that you could explore yeah, to an extent to like, find your next place you need to go yeah it was linear but it was still open world in a sense final fantasy seven and eight being two of the better ones i think uh for that and then 10 very much got away from that you get that uh, at like near the end of the game right you get an airship like yeah. after lady unaleska uh yeah it's after unaleska and then like final fantasy 8 it's towards like the tail end and then 7 i think it's like disc 3 that you can start flying around i mean in 7 you get like the 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 high buggy and the machine the submarine like you get all kinds of vehicles to like navigate around the world with i want to say 8 you do as well you get little vehicles if i recall correctly um but point being is like you have these linear games later on Final Fantasy X, I think what saved Final Fantasy X with the linearity aspect is there was a lot of character development. It's a great story. Like, it's a very beloved game for that reason. And then you look at, and then graphically, it was that next jump, right? You went from PS1 to PS2, and it was fantastic graphics. Uh, you look at 13, and thir or 12 was, I would say, not as well received, right? But um, then you look at 13. And 13 was super linear, and a lot of people complained about the characters and the development and the story. And then you look at uh, 15, and 15 is kind of that same issue, right? Like, it's I would praise it for, like, its open-world nature, the graphics, everything was stellar in that regard. But then the character development was very bad. Well, they locked a lot of that away behind the DLC that didn't come out till much later, and the anime that was accompanying it, and the movie that was accompanying it. Yeah, and you get this, even the Royal Edition that I had purchased uh, with DLC, I didn't even play the DLC because I didn't want to play any more Final Fantasy 15 after a while. Mm -hmm. You still had to purchase other DLC because it wasn't on the Royal Edition. Oh, wow. So there was other DLC that hadn't come out yet, and then yet yeah, you released the Royal Edition, which mm -hmm. to me made no sense. So yeah, I mean, that was plagued by poor story and uh, character development, but great open world. And then this one, it sounds like it's you know, good story and everything else, but there's the linear aspects in the combat that people were like, well, I'm kind of over this. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think Square just, like I said, needs to kind of take a step back and, and really analyze its successes and failures and pros and cons of each of their last few games and, like, give the fans something that's a mix of all of it, right? Like, great story, some open world, and some turn-based combat. I think if you get all three of those things, you're looking at, well, I don't know, 90% of every other JRPG that's in market right now, uh, like the Tales series, and, or Trails series, I should say, mm -hmm. um, and, and all those games, and Ease as well. Like, Ease is... I haven't played those yet, but I've heard nothing but, like, positive reviews on Ease. I think Ease is an action RPG, though. Uh, I believe it is, yeah. So, I mean, like... Definitely RPGs have never been, like, you know, the top sales-busting numbers. And a lot of people do view that turn-based as, like, a barrier to wanting to play. Like, the drive for the market is definitely going action direction. People, more people want action games than RPG fans exist to desire the classic turn-based system. But did and with them remaking seven? all these old games, there's going to be room... Like, we were just talking Final Fantasy IX or X, whatever one is going to get remade next. Like, the, if they do that, you know, with a classic 
turn-based combat system. Like you can appease those fans in those ways, or like Persona, that's all turn-based. Well, the Final Fantasy VII remake didn't have the option for both. You could do turn-based, or you could do action. So you could just like play actiony, and then you go into like a uh, like a Vats style system where like everything slows down to like almost time standing still, but not quite. And you can menu and select attacks and stuff, but a lot of it is like your your guys just have like a regular basic attack that you do, and then you wait for like cooldowns on their abilities or magic or to use items. So you'll like swap between characters and just kind of use like their special or use a spell and then swap to the other person while they're just doing their auto attack to re gen their bars yeah i mean I, I get you know where the market is going for a lot of these action rpgs and but if you look at a lot of the indie games that are coming out there's a lot of indie games that are turn based there's indie games that are mm-hmm. tactical based and they're all pretty successful for what they're doing and so i mean again if you're square and you look at what the market is buying and if they're buying into a lot of these indie games that are turn based and yeah but tactical you're not gonna based, get 10 million sales no with no. that and that's but, where they want to go. But look at the success that those indie games are having with very little marketing development, right? So, like, if you are Square, you have an entire fan base out there that's playing indie games, you know, and, and they're turn-based and tactical, and they're buying these indie games. If Just with the marketing budget alone, if you can get a good story and turn-based combat in there for Final Fantasy, you're going to make great sales, I think, moving forward. Yeah, I think another one of the issues is just that, like, Final Fantasy has always been, like, the pillar game for graphics. They've always been, like, the game that you look to to be like, okay, what is the the best graphics right now? That's, like, almost been synonymous with Final Fantasy. But now the graphics has caught up so much, and, like, everybody's putting that amount of budget into their games. What is really making Final Fantasy stand out? So they really are trying to probably push these other boundaries and do other things because like they just, you know, there's impressive lighting effects and particle effects and stuff going on all over the place. And other people are really getting into like, uh, what's that avowed? Yeah. Is that the one that's coming out? That's like the magic, but it's like guns, but it's magic instead. Uh, I don't know. I remember the name I, for whatever reason. I was thinking forsaken, but I know that's squares flop of the year so far yeah so there's like other really impressive like magic games with like those same kind of graphics and stuff coming out to compete against and i think that uh also it's a huge mistake like a party is such a part of final fantasy for me that like i think just having one character and like some side characters that kind of join you are like not that's not enough that's not what i want from final fantasy i want a party that like has roles or has characters that you can build into roles or like, you know, but that camaraderie, like that's what a lot of Final Fantasy is for me is like those relationships between those people. And I haven't played this, so I can't speak exactly to it. And I know that the, you know, the people who love it and even the people who don't, like I don't think they can say anything bad about the performances or anything like that. So it's not that, it's just like, I want more people that are, you know, that I interact with. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we'll see long term what these sales end up being uh, mm-hmm. on the PS5. I have heard rumors that they're going to look to start getting rid of the numbers in Final Fantasy, uh, which <laughs> honestly is probably needed. <laughs> to Next be quite up, honest. Final Fantasy Plus. Yeah, right. No, I think... Super Final Fantasy. I think the numbers might need to go away at some point. Like, what other series can you think of that's up to 16? Like... I mean, they don't call it Mario 20, but yeah. there's more than 20 Mario. Exactly, exactly the point, right? So, like, it's Final Fantasy, right? Add another name to it. But it's like, that's... The, but you, like, the Roman numerals of Final Fantasy, like, that's, like, their thing. I get it, but... Like, I would say if you were another game to shy away from it, but if you're Final Fantasy, like, I would keep going with that because that's, like, you're the only one that's that far ahead. So it's not like you're the other game that's on their 20th title. You're the game on the 20th title, and everybody else is chasing you. Well, before we get into articles, I do question what the artwork is going to be for Final Fantasy 30. 
<laughs> Final Fantasy X, X, X. This one's super mature. This yeah. was also the first mature Final Fantasy. Yeah, I, I saw that So that, that locks out some potential younger customers. That is true. That does lock out a, a huge uh, fan base there. So you're going to have a lot of parents. I don't know about a lot, but a lot of parents that uh, figure, oh, it's going to be too violent of a game. So I don't want to buy my kid a mature rated game and have them overthrow the government of France, which <laughs> leads into our first article. For Good the day, segue. Right. Uh, so after days of destruction, Marcone blames a familiar Macron. boogeyman. Huh? Macron. Macron. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll call him Marcone because I don't know. Uh, he, he's crazy, right? Uh, the boogeyman is video games. And is a, this was through NPR, uh, Vanessa Romo. Uh, so I'll pronounce her name correctly. And, you know, it's when there's violence, right? Who, who's to blame when violence is occurring? Well, yeah. video games, like as always. The same song and dance. Yeah. So go on. I see you got a few notes here. Yeah. So um, this is that same thing where politicians decide to blame uh, violent video games on violence. And as we all know, in the long history of France, uh, violent video games were the main inciting incident in the 1780s during the French Revolution. So obviously there's a one-to-one correlation there that Look, I mean, you know, he's fully aware of and informed upon. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, if you look at the cartel on the border of Mexico, like all of their inspiration comes from GTA. Oh, yeah. For sure. Like they would not be dealing with drugs and all that if it was not for Grand Theft Auto. A fully upstanding citizen, Ex- less for Rockstar's corruption. Truly, no corruption in their government and police force. None of that. It would all be gone. It's just because of GTA. That's where it all started. Yeah, so uh, it's it's always one of these things to bring out and try to shirk responsibility and make people think about something other than your shitty government and how bad of a job you're doing and why everybody wants to violently overthrow things. Yeah, it, it just it always baffles me that the the result of it is like, oh, well, we need a scapegoat, you guys. Like, things are not going so great. Oh, yeah, video games. That's right. Like, that's always been a, a good go-to, right? No, come on now. So... Yeah, I don't think, uh, you know, unless people are wielding swords and trying to throw fireballs and stuff and put devil circles and <laughs> satanic circles and rituals to summon Ifrit, you know, then uh, or Ifrit, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think video games are to blame there. But uh, you know what? Where people are to blame is uh, porn mods in Skyrim. <laughs> so I don't know what the hell. This is a random You bunch hadn't of heard of this? This, this has been blown up this no, week. No, I'm just saying, like all the articles uh, that we we're talking about this week. So uh, Skyrim porn mods. Uh, that was all messed up. Skyrim porn mods uh, spark voice actor backlash over AI deepfakes. And this is Austin Wood at Game Radar. Uh, so I did look into this uh, because I was very curious. I didn't go into any of my own mods because that would be very weird. Um, but yeah, so basically people are taking, uh, they're using AI to create um, porn mods in Skyrim and utilizing, and some of it being like voice work, if I recall too, so that yeah, you, you kind of have like the face and voice in these like scantily clothing in Skyrim. Yeah, so I mean, sexy mods for Skyrim, that's nothing new, but... Really what's going on here is with the advent of AI technology, and this has been something that you know the industry's been talking about for a while, but this is like really the first big clash, I think, where modders are you know scraping all of the voice data from the game and then making those voice actors say things that they never said and sometimes in an explicit contents. And that is really uncool. I mean, yeah. consent in like... NSFW stuff is the absolute key that makes it okay. So without that, everything's out the window and it's just not okay on its face. And I, I'm just imagining like I haven't seen any of this. I'm just wondering like, is the voice work because it's Skyrim, like, oh, would you like to see my ankle? You know, like <laughs> It's it's period of appropriate. <laughs> period appropriate. It has to be. So, like, you know, maybe the voice actors are going up in arms for nothing. Like, it's just ankles and elbows and necks being shown, and that's all it is. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely the people in the industry who are probably the most worried for their jobs right now. And, I mean, we've had a lot of dealings with different voice actors, and I know you know a lot of them more personally. Like, maybe at some point we could see if we could get somebody to talk about this with us. That would be a good idea. But... I mean, when it's a mod, 
the modders think to themselves, well, hey, I'm not going to make any money off of this. This is just a fun thing that I'm doing and distributing on the internet for free. But, I mean, that can still really do harm and impact the careers of these people. Like, you're perpetuating this technology that's very, you know, ethically questionable. And especially when you are have no consent or right given from the actors to use their voice or likeness of their voice or data from their voice to build these, you know, generative systems, like... That's completely uncool, and eventually, even though you think it's just fun and not hurting anybody, studios are going to see that. They're going to put things in contracts, and they're going to basically steal people's voices. I mean, Disney already does, like, and they've been doing this for a while. They do, like, full scans of everybody that's going to be in any of their movies so that they could, like, digitally recreate them if they needed to for some reason. And you know what? That makes sense, though, it, based on technology, but they're able to do that because it, there is a good point, right? Like if you have an actor in the middle of a, a series, right? Or like, like just say to Marvel movies, for example, right? Just say, you know, somebody dies in the middle of filming, right? Mm-hmm. Say it's, uh, what's his name? Chris Hemsworth, right? So now you've got to replace him with who, right? So it makes sense to have like a, a digitally created, digitally voiced I mean, if the actor's okay where, with that. Yeah, I mean, But I, you I don't want to, like, bring those people out 30 years after they're dead and puppet them around for money. Well, they kind of like, did with Star Wars. Creepy. They kind of did with Star Wars. Yeah, I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, if you had, like, if you had the consent to do it, then maybe it's okay. But, like, yeah, in, like, what was it, Grand Moff Tarkin? The guy that they totally like CGI remade. I don't know the names offhand, but yeah, I just remember they they completely remade and did CGI and everything for him and the voice and everything mm-hmm. else, and it looks legit, which yeah. is kind of scary. Um, but yeah, AI in general, it's like it's a cool tool, but at the same time, it's scary. I've heard deep fake voicing uh, on videos and such before, and it's crazy how close it is. I think it's going to get to a point where like you could be in court and you know say you really did something, and you're like, no, that was AI. You remember I didn't say Sassy that. Justice? Uh, the I Trump, do. <laughs> like yeah. news thing? I do remember Sassy Justice, but I don't remember exactly that one. You'll have to send it to me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're going to get to a point where AI, it's going to be to blame, right? Like, no, I didn't say that, Your Honor. It was AI. Like, nope, that wasn't me. It was AI generated. That's not actually me on camera. Yeah. You know, like little things like that. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's a, a scary point in terms of that. Cool with AI, but also kind of scary. And um, I'm going to keep an eye on this one. It's actually pretty interesting, and I'll see if maybe we can get a, a voice actor for comment. Um, but, yeah. So let's move into uh, the next thing here in terms of uh, copying, and that is The Last of Us is uh, ripped off from the Nintendo eShop. So, of course, it was played uh, by Victoria Kennedy at Eurogamer. And this is called V Last Hope. Uh, and it is like the same font style. It is the same stacked lettering. It literally has a character named Brian and a female character named Eve who have gone through a time machine into the future to try and stop something from happening, which I don't know why you'd go to the future to stop something from happening. I think, I think the premise from the trailer was that Brian, a soldier, a father, was sent to the future to try to find like a, a cure Maybe for the zombie plague to bring it back to stop the bad future from happening. I didn't get that from that, but it seemed to me like they had a time machine and shit went wrong after a time machine was used. No, because they said that they were going to send him to try to find a solution. Well, regardless of the solution, he's facing a bunch of zombies with a girl that looks very much like Ellie. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, it, while it is different, I mean, it is a different game. It is also very much trying to utilize visual aspects. And I say visual lightly because the game looks like it was released on a DS. Um, <laughs> I mean, it really does. It's pretty bad graphically. Um, but it tries to really kind of lean on The Last of Us as a way to get people to jump in on it. Yeah, it's it's like they made something distinct and different. It's not like they made The Last of Us. They're just using everything about the last of us to try to you know 
do a bait and switch on you. Like they're trying to make it like, look how last of this 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 is. Wow, that was a weird sentence. Yeah. <laughs> Look how much this is The Last of Us, and it's on the Switch, so that hopefully, you know, X number of people pay however much it costs for the game. Like, it's probably like a 5 or $10 thing. Actually, not even that. It's a dollar, right? No, it's uh, 99 pence, so I guess that's, what, one pound? So, like, okay. like $1.25, two okay. bucks on yeah. our store. So, it's a cheap game, and they're trying to rope you in with all of those... Uh, you know, aping aesthetics, and and now it's just like, okay, this is not even worth <laughs> the well, time. And this is what they wanted, right? They wanted us to talk about Last of Us from Wish dot com, mm-hmm. and That's or, exactly or what Timu it is. or Timu. I guess it could be that one now too, right? Uh, but you know, obviously, this article comes out. It's on YouTube. We're talking about it. There's other people playing it. Like people are going to buy this just because. Of this reason. Yeah. Right? Like, that's why, oh, I want to experience it. I want to see what it is. Like, why is this so bad? I've got a dollar. Let me do that. Multiply that by 100,000 curious people, and you've made Masticus. some pretty decent money. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's uh, it's an interesting uh, development on this one. Um, I think you have your notes here about not being, or about being surprised that this hasn't come out before. Yeah. I mean, as, as old as the Switch is, and as old as the last of it is, like, Stuff like this has to be common. Like, this isn't the first... There was the... They reference it in the article, too. The There's of the War. God of War that was on Xbox. Well, that's another one. I mean, that God of War's been out since PS2. So, like, yeah. the fact that a, just recently in the last year, a ripoff type game came out is kind of surprising uh, in itself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not really surprised it's taken this long to get some sort of, like, ripoff. Because if you think about it, no, like, good developer is going to sit there and do this. Right, you have to have somebody who is not—I wouldn't even say indie quality, right? Like somebody who is very much seller dweller type of um, developer who doesn't really give a shit in terms of the—they uh, just do like yeah, uh, like their integrity or whatever. Buy like the, assets and do asset flip games. Uh, yeah, maybe this is more common on Steam, and the reason we're seeing headlines for this is because this is on a Nintendo platform, and that God of War was on an Xbox platform, like it's. It's breached over into the console space where you would expect this janky garbage to be on the PC because that's where it is born and lives. Yeah, I mean, that might be where it was initially. I'm not sure. Um, I didn't look too much into it. But, you know, I just, there's no, no like, well, I don't know, no good developer is going to sit there and try and do something like this. Like, mm-hmm. you have to be somebody who is just not really good. Like, it's good in terms of what they were able to create. Well, what about right? all the, like, Doom clones? From back in the day, like Wolfenstein. Actually, I think Wolfenstein came before too. But like, and that was Nazis. <laughs> so, but I mean, there's there's a huge history of like this game, but just a little bit different. Yeah, but this is like this game, but it looks like a really shitty version of it. Yeah, you yeah. Know? I mean, the quality's not there, but like self-respecting. That's where I was looking at. No self-respecting developer is going to create this. Yeah, and it, it does take somebody to just take. This could have been, you know, eight years of development for somebody to finally get like, oh, this is my creation. <laughs> it's my my Let's terrible version. But I mean, that's possible. That's what it is because no no good developer is going to waste the time to release something like this, knowing that it's going to be misrepresented and not misrepresented. It's going to be taken like this. Yeah. So I think that's it takes a special type of organization to do this. I guess with The Last of Us too, I mean The Last of Us is so like the story and, and what it means to people is so heavy that like another studio just trying to do a bad version of that or make their own version of that, it's gonna get spotted out and called out. No developer really wants to be like, Oh, we tried to like do our own kind of clone of The Last of Us, and it's like people just wouldn't go for that, probably. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, dive into our last segment here, which is our inflation deflation, and we played some Returnal. It was developed by House, House Marquee. Mark? House, I always say Marquee. Oh, is it House Marquee? Yeah, I always say House Marquee, but it could be House Mark. I think it's House Marquee. Uh, it was published by Sony Interactive Entertainment, directed by Harry Krueger. Um, for whatever reason, I'm supposed to say Freddy. Uh, it was released in April of 2021. It is a third-person shooter roguelike. It received uh, about an 8 out of 10 on average scores. And the overall synopsis here is Selene Vassos, an astronaut who lands on a planet, Atropos, in search of the mysterious white shadow. Signal and finds herself yeah, finds herself trapped in a time loop. I don't know why. That 
white shadow signal and find yourself in the trap time loop. It's kind of weird how it's written. Trapped in a time loop. Trapped in, in a time loop. Yeah. Yeah. So basically we played loop, def loop last year or last week. I don't know why I said last year. Uh, and we didn't have that great of a time. So it was like, let's find a game that, you know, I know and from hearing reviews and seeing videos is probably more up our alley. I've been so excited to play this game yeah. ever since it was announced. What's so crazy, dude, is like Deathloop received like 10 out of 10 scores from various, you know, publications. And this one, I think it did, but not, it wasn't as like well received and well, compared to Deathloop. And I think a lot of it has to do with money. Well, I think it's because this is like a roguelike bullet hell game and like some people just can't do that as well. Whereas Deathloop was like almost too accessible. Like anybody could go through Deathloop because the AI is dumb as rocks. Oh yeah. It's so absolutely this stupid. is a game that's going to challenge you. And if you can't get through it because it's too much like frantic shooting for you, I mean, you're probably not going to be able to recommend it as highly or as widely. Well, let's go over and provide your, your overall feedback, and then I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, so uh, Returnal is a shooter, roguelike, uh, third-person game. You go through each iteration of your life, you know, starting fresh. And as you reach certain progress points, like killing major bosses and going on to the next biome, you'll unlock kind of like a Metroidvania style, like permanent, you know, thing that will help you be able to like get through quicker or, or whatever. I've watched a few runs on like GDS or a GDQ and I've watched some people play online before. Uh, I dig a roguelike and you know, it's a super popular genre and to see one with like this high fidelity of graphics and, it does have like a lot of different kind of systems going on. It does have like an, an interesting story with like a compelling mystery to it. Uh, I think overall as a package, it's very enticing. And that's why I've been wanting to play it forever, but no PS5. So I had to wait until now. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I felt graphically this game was fantastic. The music and the, the sounds oh, to me yeah. are just like, they're so fitting for what you're playing. Yeah. Uh, which is great. The uh, You're right. Like the changing environments are, are pretty cool, right? Like, so we go into things and we're like, oh yeah, that's, we were just here. But no, you weren't. Like it, it's just a very similar looking atmosphere to where you were before. Um, I think the revenge piece uh, was pretty mm. cool, right? So whenever you kind of come across uh, an orange or black box, uh, you know, of yourself having died somewhere, it shows similar to Dark Souls, like, oh, you died here, and it's like, avenge. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. And then you're like, boss battle or some other mm -hmm. battle that you're locked into, like everything locks around you. And then that's where you get ether, which allows you to do different things. So unlocking things, being able to, um, God, what was the purple thing called? Uh, so they had the, the malignants that are like... Yeah. There's certain chance of getting, you know, a negative side effect when you're trying to pick up certain items. But you can use ether to clean the malignants, and then that would allow you to get positive benefits and such. So, like, there's little things like that. You pick up different weapons throughout the way, uh, special attacks tied to those weapons. And again, like Ryan said, like, there's perma things that, that you grab onto, right? So, like, your side piece is permanent, but um, you might come across, like, some sort of um, automatic weapon that has lightning that shoots out of it and that you might get during one run and then you might pick it up later on after you die mm -hmm. uh where we where we were we were looking for like a grappling hook uh that would have allowed us to go somewhere else uh across this chasm but we didn't get that yet that would have been a perma item obviously uh we I know picked you up get like a melee like sword that you can use i think that's how you get through those like vines that were blocking off some of the it, it really yeah. like will tease you in the environment and show you Things that you don't really know what to do with, but I'm sure many hours on into the game, you go back to those areas just like in a Metroid where it's like, ah, now I can just shortcut and skip this whole second level and go straight to level three. Yeah, and there's a couple of things that we didn't really pay too much attention to. Like there was an adrenaline boost that you get. I imagine it probably increases your attack or, or uh, integrity on your uh, suit. So there's, there's tons of things that are going on. I, I would say that's probably the hardest thing for me is that there is a lot going on and then the lack of the like save feature. There's only the suspend mode. Um, and so that, that kind of makes it a little difficult at times too. So I'm, I'm kind of curious when I boot it back up how that's going to look. Uh, and then what was the other component that I, I really liked? 
Um, God, I don't know. I'm just forgetting offhand. But like in general, just to me, the game was very much like what I would anticipate for a looping based game of having to like continually do the same thing, but progress, right? Um, Looper was, or Deathloop, I keep saying Looper because they're a movie. Uh, Deathloop was very different from this in that you can die like once or twice, right? And you can pick up things to, to allow you to kind of keep progressing. And if you say you get to a certain like checkpoint in the map area and you die, well, you kind of start back there, right? This is like straight up from your crash point, yeah. uh, which to me is, a, while it can be a pain in the ass for some people, I thought that was a really cool component of it, right? You pick up your permanent items and then you can continue to use those items throughout and then you continue to progress and go from there. Um, I think that's honestly just a better version of what we were anticipating with Deathloop. I, I thought Deathloop was going to be more like that and more of that first person shooter continue from the beginning and then keep going and doing your thing. But no, it was completely different and janky and everything I would have expected from a Bethesda based release. Yeah. I mean, not to just keep piling on to death loop. I know we kind of talked it down so much last week, but after that, I went back and I watched some old reviews from people and yeah, my boy skill up. He said like the same thing that I was saying, like what's with all these fucking menus. Like <laughs> you can't do anything when you're playing the game you can only do stuff when you're in the menu. Like, time doesn't move forward. You can't change your loadout. There's very little that you can do that is involved with the greater game when you're actually playing. Everything's done in the menu. <laughs> yeah. This was, and this was, uh, uh, as far as Returnal was, this was very much more like up my alley as far as fast paced. Um, difficult, but not too difficult in what we experienced. Uh, like I said, great music, great story that we've experienced so far. You're constantly unlocking different pieces of your your past, in a sense, mm -hmm. right? Or your your other self. Uh, we got to a point where she says, oh, I've interacted with other forms of myself, which leads me to believe that, like, you're going to come across another Celine mm. at some point. Like, the two of you will actually meet face-to-face. -face. So... I, I don't know, man. I'm intrigued. Like, this is one that I definitely need to continue playing for sure. Yeah. So, getting down to brass tacks on this one. Man, complete inbox down to $19.91. That's a pretty good price. I picked mine up for $17 bucks by way with tax included and nice. shipping. Uh, and that peaked at $53.84 back in April 21 when this came out. And that price is holding real steady. Uh, we got a loose price at fifteen ninety nine, peaked at forty six sixty six. Also back in April twenty one when it came out, it's turning slightly up. Uh, for digital on console, uh, it is sixty nine ninety nine. But if you have the PS Plus Extra tier, it is included for free in that. Uh, on PC, it is uh, fifty nine ninety nine. But advertised on Steam right now, they got twenty percent off, so forty seven ninety nine there. So I want people to consider this for a second, too. When you hear these prices, we're talking about a game that came out two years ago, mm -hmm. right? 70 bucks on PlayStation, $60 on PC, and it's on sale for $48. Why in the world do people want to move to digital-only based games when you can pick this game up right now for 20 bucks, complete in box? I like, mean, people just, you know, convenience and, you know, just because they aren't, Thrifty. I mean, I spend, you know, probably the last two years buying mostly digital games like on Switch for the convenience of having them in one place. But also not all of those games that I got were like physical release titles like with indies and stuff and with Steam. Like I feel like people are just used to that market now so much so that like that's obviously the direction things are going like when you look at like sales charts now i think it's like 80 percent of people buy their games digitally even if it is a physical release title but yeah i mean 20 bucks complete in box like by the time i get a ps5 i'll get this thing for 10 bucks <laughs> yeah so for me i think this game is easily like a 9 out of 10 if i was to rate it um as far as inflate or deflate it I paid twenty bucks. I paid twenty bucks. I'd probably pay thirty bucks for this one. You know, so you'd say deflated. I think it's deflated, dude. Right. I, I think like the quality is there. I think the quality is there for sure. I'm gonna agree with you. Yeah, because it really is. I mean, it, as little time as I've spent with this game now, versus the amount of time that I've really wanted to play this game, and how much it lived up to that expectation, and how I really 
am excited to be able to play it once I have the opportunity to really sit down and sink my teeth into. Like, this will be one of those, like, early PS5 games that I will for sure go back to once I get a PS5. Final Fantasy 16? I don't know. I mean, the Final Fantasy 16, will I buy it when it's 20 bucks? Sure. I'll buy it when it's 20 bucks because it'll probably be like a, a Royal Edition on that, right? Uh, or a Game of the Year Edition. I'll definitely do that. But um, this right here, I mean, dude, if you sell this for like 25, 30 bucks right now and you had heard great things, I mean, you'd probably right now, if this game went up to $30 a year from now and you got a PS5, I guarantee you'd probably still buy it. I'd probably just bucks. borrow it from you. You probably would. <laughs> you probably would because I have it now. But point being is if I didn't have it, yeah. you'd probably buy it at $30. Yeah, yeah given what you played. So uh, that is deflated. Uh, I don't know what we're playing next week. We haven't talked about it. We'll figure it out. We'll get to it. But this has been episode 243 of the Game Players Podcast. My name is John. I'm Ryan. And thanks for listening.